historical perspective. A special welcome to our distinguished panelists, Dr. Mar Dr. Marlene Doubt, Dr. Brandon Bird, and Dr. Natalie Pierre. Before we begin, I first want to acknowledge the vision and support of Albert LePage, whose generosity allowed us to establish the LePage Center in 2017. And I want to encourage you to attend the LePage Center's remaining events of the academic year. On Wednesday, April 12th, the final panel on climate change in historical perspective will focus on ways in which climate change has shaped urban environments, a discussion moderated by my colleague, Dr. Caroline Murphy. And on Thursday, April 20th, we are hosting Katie Wirth, the award-winning journalist for GBH's Frontline series, who will share with us the research for her book, Miseducation, How Climate Change is Taught in America. Both of these virtual events begin at 6 p.m. and require advanced registration. To register, please visit the LePage Center homepage. Finally, I want to thank LePage Center Administrator Kevin Fox for organizing tonight's event, and he will now introduce our moderator, Dr. Magan Keda. Kevin. Thank you, Dr. Roger. Magan Keda is Professor of History and Global Interdisciplinary Studies and the founding director of both the Institute for Global Interdisciplinary Studies and the Africana Studies Program at Villanova University. Cato's Race and the Writing of History, Riddling the Sphinx, uh, received the 13th Annual Cheikh Anta Award for Best Scholarly Book, 2000. Uh, Dr. Cato is editor of the Conceptualizing, Reconceptualizing Africa, the Construction of African Historical Identity, and author of A Political Economy of Healthcare in Senegal, both from Brill. Uh, former chair of the Board of Trustees of the College Board, Dr. Keita is also editor-in-chief for Africa for the Journal of, Afri of Asian and African Studies and author of a number of scholarly publications. Dr. Keita. Thank you, Kevin. Um, first, uh, good evening, everyone. And I want you to know that I'm delighted to serve as a moderator for this evening's LePage Center for History and the Public Interest Discussion on Haiti. Uh, this evening, we have three brilliant scholars who will aid us in, a more, in gaining a more refined and nuanced understanding of Haiti and its people that defies the conventions and the tropes that mark current accounts of the Republic and its citizens. This evening, we're joined by Dr. Marlene Doe, who is an author, scholar, and editor and professor. Her books include The Tropics of Haiti, Race and the Literary History. History of the Haitian Revolution in the Atlantic World, Baron de Vosti, and the Origins of the Black Atlantic Humanism, and the forthcoming Awakening the Ashes, an Intellectual History of the Haitian Revolution. Her articles on Haitian history and culture have appeared in the New York Times, Harper's Bazaar, Essence, The Nation, and the LA Review of Books. She has won several awards and grants and fellowships for her contributions to historical and cultural understandings of the Caribbean, notably from the Ford Foundation, the American Council of Learned Schol Societies, and the Haitian Studies Association. Currently, Professor Doubt is Professor of French and African American Studies at Yale University. Dr. Brandon Bird is a scholar of Black intellectual and social history, and he is author of The Black Republic, African Americans and the Fate of Haiti. He's also co-editor of Ideas in Unexpected Places, Reimagining Black Intellectual History. Professor Byrd is Associate Professor of History at Vanderbilt University. Dr. Natalie Pierre is Assistant Professor of History at Howard University and a 2023 National Endowment for Humanities Fellow. She earned her PhD in history and the African diaspora in the Caribbean and Latin America from New York University. Within her research agenda, Professor Pierre highlights the plans and processes of people of African descent set into motion in order to sustain sites of autonomy across the America. She's currently working on her first book, The Vessel of Independence Must Save Itself, Haitian State Formation in seven, from 1757 through 1815. As you can see, we're in for quite an evening that is going to inform us about questions of Haiti and the struggles of the Haitian people over time. 
Without further ado, I'm going to turn the session over to Professor Pierre. Good evening, everyone. Thank you all for taking the time to be with us. So first, I would like to thank Dr. Kita and the LePage Center for inviting me to share my ideas on Haiti and how the world system engineers the failure of democracy. I begin with a brief passage from the three-time Hugo Award winner, N.K. Jemsen's short story titled, The Effluent Engine. This was the dance of things, the creak crack as the storyteller said in Jessaline's lands. Everyone needed something from someone. Glorious France needed money to recover from Napoleon's endless wars. Upstart Haiti had money from the sweet gold of its sugarcane fields, but needed guns. For the world, it seemed, wanted the newborn country strangled in its crib. The United States had guns, but craved sugar, as its fortunes were dependent upon the acquisition thereof. It alone was willing to treat with Haiti. Though Haiti was the stuff of American nightmare, a nation of black slaves who had killed off their white masters, end quote. In this fantastical story, Jessaline, a female James Bond sort of character, briefly migrates to these United States on a top secret mission. Set shortly after the Haitian Revolution, Jessaline, possibly named after one of Haiti's founding fathers, arrives in New Orleans on a quest to commodify the noxious waste produced by rum distillation. Distil distillation excuse me. The enslaved Africans who cultivated sugarcane for Francis Saint-Domingue also produced rum from those same stalks. In Jemson's science fiction telling of the tale, the enslaved Africans who became Haitian, courtesy of the decade-long revolution, figured out that the rum waste could be converted into a chemical that would enable freedom on the island. No worries, I don't plan on spoiling the plot of the effluent engine for you. You can find it in a collection of short stories titled, How Long Till the Black Future Month? Nonetheless, Jemson's story about repurposing waste to finance Black freedom ignited a series of thoughts about Haiti's role in constructing the West. Slavery in the Americas is one of the engines that birthed modern capitalism in that the cash crop production of coffee, indigo, tobacco, sugar generated massive amounts of wealth for European countries. Sugar is a calorie dense product that European monarchs and then governments quickly came to see as stimulants to keep their workers alert in factories. The industrial revolution meant that people were working 12, 14, 16 hours away from home. They couldn't, they physically couldn't do it if they didn't have sustaining food. The caloric denseness of sugar surpassed something like cabbage, and it replaced this staple in the European diet. These slave-produced cash crops fed the global market. Through the wealth generated in colonial Saint-Domingue, now Haiti, France and other European American thinkers had the luxury of time to refine their ideas around political and economic philosophy. Haiti emerges from this dual revolution, which refers to the liberal political philosophies that emphasized individual liberty and the first industrial revolution that transformed and modernized the modern global economy. Access to political liberty was beyond bounds for most actors held in racialized bondage. As a dominant producer of coffee, 60% and 50% by the end of the Seven Years' War, so the Seven Years' War was a global conflict that ended in 1763. 
By this point, colonial Haiti was a major engine of the equally important industrial revolution and the shift from mercantilism to free trade. So mercantilism was an economic philosophy that bound colonial profits to metropolitan treasuries, to free trade. And of course, free trade is the, is the economic philosophy that individual actors are free to trade with whomever they want without imperial or national restriction. As in the 19th century with Haiti's genesis, there remains a tension between economic and political liberalism. In the 19th century, the support of individual liberty could undermine the profits produced by captives. And this is precisely what happened. Enslaved revolutionaries embraced the French revolutionary slogan of liberty, equality, and fraternity. The belief in such ideals led to the collapse of a lucrative slave society based on agricultural production. Haiti is still bound to agricultural production, but without the, without the deliberate exploitation of those former colonial masters. In a time where humans were recorded as assets in accounting books, any belief system and or political philosophy would undermine the flourishing of capital. Therefore, after Dessalines' death, the nation's capital holding classes created foreign and domestic policy to promote the circulation of capital by selling undervalued sugar and coffee to the global market. So in other words, at this point in the early 19th century, Haiti is supplying 60% of all coffee that enters the global economy's diet and 50% of the coffee. The nation that is the majority migrant African populace of Haiti rejected the embrace of free trade and created what Jean Casimir calls a, a counter plantation society. Haitian state formation, however, required significant innovation to currents of political theory circulating across the Atlantic. During Louverture's reign, the unequivocal ban against slavery came marred by maintaining the system of militarized agriculture. To finance the military that maintained universal emancipation, Haitian leaders restricted the individual liberty of Haitian citizens. It became a circular trap, restricting freedoms to finance the military that protected the freedom and independence of Haiti, the state, and the nation. Further, the unequitable quasi-illegal trade agreements made with earnest trading partners in the U.S. and Britain expanded free trade across the Americas. The pitfall of this economic progress was the de-democratization of Haitian society. Trio called this system a republic for the merchants that was, oh, running out of time, a republic for the merchants that was in favor of the nation's elites and merchants who were abroad. This system remains the dominant relation that Haiti has with global powers. To close, I want to consider another conceptualization of dual revolutions as formulated by Leon Trotsky. As both a participant and theorist of the Russian Revolution, Trotsky argued that a sustainable, and in his case, a socialist revolution, required a dual revolution meaning that a democratic revolution needed to aim to establish basic political freedoms and to overthrow the ruling autocratic regime, while the socialist revolution would aim to establish a worker state and control the means of production. These changes locally would need to be replicated globally. 
He surmised that it would be impossible to sustain such a radical change to a nation's mode of production without support across the world. This then might be our assignment as global citizens concerned with Haiti's fate. Our governments, both here in Haiti, violated the social contract. As one of the lines in the Haitian national anthem says, there is strength in our arms. And I think we can begin to discuss how to share our resources and partner with Haitian citizens who are struggling both in Haiti and abroad. Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Pierre. Professor Bird, uh, would you like to speak to the issue? Absolutely. Uh, Professor Kata, thank you. Uh, thanks to the LePage Center, uh, Kevin, who I know has worked hard on getting us here today. Thanks everybody in attendance. It's just a, it's a pleasure to be here in conversation with, uh, with all of y'all and especially two scholars that I, that I admire a great deal. Um, so first off, let me say that I, I encourage everybody to look at this recent uh, New Yorker uh, article that uh, one of our uh, panelists, uh, Marlene, uh, has uh, recently published. Uh, it, it's phenomenal and it's gonna be my starting point today. Uh, it's titled, uh, What is the Path Forward for Haiti? Um, and in that article, uh, uh, Marlene asks, uh, how can Haiti move forward out of the present crisis? And how can the world do right by nation, it's so often wrong. And it's particularly that second question that I, that I wanna think about today uh, and uh, share some thoughts on, uh, in part because it's, it's, it's something that I've thought about um, you know, a lot in a scholarly and also just a everyday fashion. Um, and also because I think it's incumbent upon us, uh, and by us I'm speaking explicitly as, as residents and uh, citizens of the US, uh, to take that seriously due to the role that our, our nation has had in, uh, in, in Haiti's history. Um, and so to get at that, I, I basically just want to tell a, a brief story, a uh, brief historical uh, vignette, if you will, uh, centered on uh, the life and activism of uh, Ebenezer Don uh, Carlos Bassett. Okay. Uh, so Ebenezer Don Carlos Bassett, uh, he was born uh, legally free in Connecticut in 1833. Uh, he's from a, uh, a very proud family, also uh, legally free. Uh, his father was one of the last uh, black governors of uh, his town in Connecticut. This is an honorary, uh, but very uh, important position amongst uh, antebellum black northerners. Uh, Bassett, uh, he, he's exceptional in many ways. And in one of those ways is that he's very, uh, very well educated. Uh, he would graduate uh, with honors from the Connecticut Normal, uh, Connecticut State Normal School. Uh, that's present day. I think it's like Central Connecticut State. It's uh, uh, yeah, uh, one of those parts of uh, uh, University of Connecticut system. Uh, he then goes on to teach in New Haven uh, and also take classes in Greek, Latin, math, uh, literature at Yale. Uh, he was an activist, uh, you know, through and through. He was a uh, subscriber of uh, Frederick Douglass's paper, uh, an attendee at colored conventions in Connecticut. Um, he eventually became the principal of Philadelphia's Colored Youth, uh, Institute for Colored Youth, which is uh, uh, one of the most uh, prestigious uh, black educational institutions uh, of the antebellum period, uh, just educates a slew of uh, the black intelligentsia and activists of the era. Uh, so in all of this, uh, uh, all of this matters because it made, makes him in the parlance of the day a representative race man, basically somebody who was fit for uh, the position he would uh, come to inhabit and uh, come to some manner of fame more in his day than ours. Uh, he would become the first uh, U.S. Uh, black diplomat. Um, in 1869, he goes to Haiti as the U.S. minister resident and consul general to Haiti. Um, of course, that's... Uh, uh, a period only shortly after the U.S. had finally uh, granted diplomatic recognition uh, to Haiti, six decades after its independence. Uh, when he arrives there, uh, he certainly arrives uh, with some biases. Uh, he arrives in Port-au-Prince 
and immediately writes to uh, a longtime confidant, Frederick Douglass, that it was in a uh, un-American state. Those are his words. Um, and in that position, he's certainly an agent of the U.S. state, too. He's expected to do things like uh, uh, advocate for the claims of uh, U.S. citizens in Haiti who were doing all sorts of, um, you know, sketchy things. Uh, but he also approaches it, uh, his diplomatic uh, position as an opportunity, as an opportunity to uh, learn some things about Haiti and Haitians, uh, in many ways to develop a different consciousness. Uh, he approaches it uh, with the understanding that it's an opportunity to establish some bilateral uh, relations that center race diasporically, transnationally. Uh, one of the visitors uh, from the United States, a friend of Bassett who would visit him there, uh, said that uh, Bassett made a great many uh, friends for himself, uh, not just amongst uh, the Haitian political elite, uh, but uh, among the majority. Uh, this visitor said that uh, Bassett was extremely popular. Uh, again, we have to take that with a grain of salt, but there's aspects of that that ring true. Bassett would become fluent uh, in Creole during his time um, in his diplomatic service. Uh, one of his professional relations was Stephen Preston, a uh, longtime uh, Haitian minister to the United States, opponent of U.S. annexationism. Uh, eventually, Bassett's term of service ends in 1877. Uh, when he leaves, uh, due to uh, at least what uh, Haitian uh, professionals and elites, particularly those in the government, uh, see as his capacities and also sympathies with Haiti, uh, he is rewarded with the position as uh, Haiti's consul in New York, uh, which is not uncommon at the time to appoint, uh, for various nations to appoint non-citizens as their representatives abroad. Okay. So he serves in that position as Haiti's consul in New York for about a decade. 1889, he wants his old position back, his old diplomatic position back in Haiti, in part because it pays really, really well uh, in an era when this type of uh, employment is rare uh, for Black Americans. The plans were thwarted, though. Instead, again, his longtime confidant, Douglas, uh, would get the position, the diplomatic position in Haiti. Bassett switches tack. He writes to Douglas and says, what would you think if I would be your secretary in Haiti? Uh, he appeals for that uh, position for a number of reasons. Why? Uh, you know, he says in, in part that he knows Haitians, their language and their inspirations, uh, just as you, Douglas, know the people of Washington, D.C. Uh, he also knows that Douglas, who had no diplomatic experience at the time, was entering a very fraught position. And the position was fraught due to the meddling of the United States and also France. Okay. August 1888, uh, various parties, uh, liberal partisans and nationalists, uh, rivals of the incumbent uh, president, uh, Lysias Salomon, uh, they basically, uh, they launch an insurgency against Salomon. Uh, France and the U.S., again, were the key players uh, in this insurgency that becomes a civil war. Uh, France backed uh, Salomon's uh, successor, Francois Legitime. Uh, the U.S. backed uh, his rival, Florville Hippolyte. Uh, armed shipments to Hippolyte were provided by a man named William P. Clyde. Clyde was a leading steamship operator along the Atlantic coast and the Gulf. Uh, he was also a legal client of the U.S. Secretary of the Navy, right? So capitalism and the U.S. state are completely wedded in this instance. Uh, the goal was to seize the Mole St. Nicholas, uh, a valuable port at the uh, passage of uh, 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 the northern uh, passage of the, uh, the Windward Passage. And so Bastion wants to prepare Douglas for this task. He would serve as an interpreter, or translator, a tutor in many ways. Uh, he relays, uh, importantly, and I'm going to emphasize this, he realized what he knows by way of his Haitian confidants. Okay? He tells Douglas that his Haitian confidants wanted the U.S. and Haiti to, quote, understand each other in making mutual concessions. He says that his Haitian confidants have resolved uh, that no part of Haitian territory, including the mole, should be occupied either by France or the United States. Bassett tells Douglas that his Haitian confidence condemned the small-souled prejudiced money grabbers, the New York merchants who were steering U.S. foreign policy, 
and objected to Douglas's presence in Haiti. These Haitian confidants led Bassett to take his own strong stance in favor of Haitian sovereignty. They encouraged Bassett to urge Douglas to do the same. Okay. The Negro has been and is still subjected to murder, intimidation, and outrage in the South without a word of protest from the strong authority of the government at Washington, Bassett wrote Douglas. And that was true of the post-Reconstruction South, no doubt about it. Bassett asked Douglas, is that strong authority now to be brought there and rob him of his independence in Haiti? Okay. Of course, that's exactly what the U.S. wanted to do. In January 1891, while Douglas is uh, the U.S. diplomat in Haiti, ambassador and secretary, the U.S. warship Philadelphia anchored at Port-au-Prince. Its captain, Rear Admiral Bancroft Girardi, had been appointed as U.S. President Benjamin Harrison's special commissioner to Haiti. He was there to undermine or basically supplant Douglas. He was tasked with acquiring the Mont Saint Nicolas. Douglas was expected to comply, of course, okay, to submit. And what followed was an infamous episode in U.S. Haitian diplomacy. Over a series of negotiations, uh, these are, you have to put that in quotes, this is gunboat diplomacy, of course. Girardi demanded the mole. He argued that Hippolyte had promised it. Uh, as a reward for bringing him to power. Hippolyte and his Secretary of Foreign Affairs, the Haitian intellectual Antonio Fermin, argued that no such promises were made. They said, show me the evidence. And of course, had there been evidence, the U.S. would have had it. Ultimately, Haiti declined to cede any territory to the U.S. Douglas didn't mind that the negotiations had failed from the perspective of the U.S. Bassett was particularly joyous. When Douglas con contemplated resigning his post amid massive criticism, especially amongst the corporatist uh, northern press in particular, uh, Bassett implored Douglas to stay. He said, we need you to stave off the imperialist wolves gnashing their teeth at Haiti. Okay. So I highlight this episode because uh, I think there's a number of uh, lessons to be gleaned from here. It's a, uh, to think through that question, you know, what is the responsibility of, of the world? Um, you know, as, as we think about uh, Haiti, past, present, and future. Uh, I think uh, in here, along with you know, Malcolm X's uh, famous adage, uh, history is best qualified to reward our research. Okay. So among the timely lessons, first is... Uh, uh, the long history of U.S. imperialism in Haiti, of course. What happened in uh, uh, 1890, 1889, 1890, 1891 with this uh, attempt to seize Haitian territory was, of course, a harbinger of things to come. U.S. warships would become a routine presence in Haitian waters in the late 19th, early 20th century. In 1915, U.S. Marines came to stay. Okay. I'm often guilty of writing of uh, the occupation of ending, as ending in 1934, which in many ways is, is true due in part to the massive resistance mounted by Haitians. Uh, but there's another part of the story we have to question, uh, you know, the, the extent to which the U.S. ever really left, especially as a power exerting its uh, political and economic uh, interests um, in Haiti. Uh, other lessons, of course, with the opposition. Uh, to that imperial and neo-colonial presence. Uh, Douglas's retrospective accounts of this episode are during his tenure, those have become most famous. Um, he would write immediately upon returning to the United States in 1891, I'm charged with sympathy for Haiti. I'm not ashamed of that charge. He would write that, uh, uh, he would later say, um, you know, that, that Haiti was black and that the world had never forgiven her for being black. And that was the root uh, of these neocolonial and imperial impositions. Uh, those are important to remember and recall, but it's also uh, important to remember Bassett too. Part, how did Douglas in part reach his ideas of freedom and justice and fair play as Du Bois would celebrate him for um, uh, in regards particularly to his stances on Haiti? Well, Douglas reached those in part through Bassett and Bassett Again, I tried to put a pin in this and I want to return to it. Importantly, he was informed not just by his experience and observations in Haiti, but by listening to his Haitian confidants, 
to understand in their perspectives by trying to court uh, real solidarity. So in this moment, um, you know, when this just happened, U.S. and Canada are meeting to contemplate an invasion, and I think, make no mistake, I think that is uh, what is happening, uh, we do well to remember Bassett's words on uh, another occasion. In 1904, when asked whether the U.S. should annex Haiti, he replied firmly, no, no, let Haiti alone. Okay. As Marlene writes in, uh, again, that excellent article in New Yorker, the neo-colonial option isn't the only one. There is another way, and just as in 1804, as Bassett, I think, understood, uh, that way will have to be Haitian-led. Thanks. Thank you. Professor Dell, please. Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you so much to my co-panelists um, for your wonderful remarks, and of course to Professor Keita and and Kevin Fox and everyone um, at the LePage Center for putting this together and for inviting me here. Um, so I'm going to kind of take us back to a moment that's in the middle of the ones that my co-panelists um, have talked about. I'm gonna take us to um, Desalines Empire shortly after um, Haitian independence. Uh, so circa 1805, 1806. And uh, this is when a, a moment when Henri Christophe, um, who will become the first and last king of Haiti later, um, is actually general in chief of the Haitian army. And so um, some of the sort of pressures on Haitian independence immediately. Um, and the reason I want to focus on these immediate pressures is um, there are certain snapshots in uh, Haitian history, um, when it's sort of done in a sweeping way. Um, we talk, of course, about the onset of slave revolt and rebellion in 1791. We talk about the formal declaration of independence in January 1804. And then sometimes the leap is to 1825, which is the moment Charles X exacts his infamous indemnity. And then we jump all the way clear toward the U.S. occupation. Um, but I want to talk about some more intricate mo moments and pressures that show really just um, what Haiti's leaders had to deal with, um, not just running a state, which was hard enough on its own, um, and, and trying to figure out how to finance the state um, to protect the state from France that's still on the other side of the island, which I'll be talking about in a moment, um, and then just dealing with diplomacy in the era, how to achieve recognition from the other world powers, which is, of course, the other big story about Haitian independence is that none of the other world powers are recognizing it. So this is the moment I want to bring us to um, just to sort of think about what is it like to have an entire national history that is um, based on not other people being afraid of you, which was true, but the fear that actually Haitians, independent Haitians had and lived with every day as they wondered if the world powers in France in particular was going to quote unquote accept their independence. Um, and, and by that, I don't mean just recognize it. I mean, not try to come back and reconquer the island. So the first part is um, there'll be two snapshots here, um, the discursive war. So one of the stressors from independent Haiti uh, is, of course, that France is continuing to call the island Saint-Domingue. Um, the United States, England are calling it Santo Domingo, Saint Domingo, various iterations that they have. Um, and France is the ex French colonists are kind of papering the earth with diatribes and screeds. And in the Archive Nationale in Paris, there's an entire folder written by ex colonial officials about how to reconquer Haiti. There's plans to assassinate Dessalines, get Christophe on our side, all of these kinds of things. Well, the novelists and poets are having their say as well. Determined to paper the world with their hopes of reconquering Saint-Domingue, there were so many essays, historical works, paintings, and novels published in early 19th century France that seemed to have only the defamation of Haiti and Haitians as their goal. One of these came, uh, one of the earliest examples is actually from 1802, so before Haitian independence. The French novelist and playwright René Perrin published one of the first French fictions of the Haitian Revolution, and it was called The Burning of Cap, uh, this is the translation, or The Reign of Toussaint Louverture. Um, true to its title, the novel follows the movements of Toussaint and his army of formerly enslaved soldiers. The novelist's sympathy is clearly on the side of the French colonists and the white planters, so the enslavers. 
He says in the preface, I'm going to take us into the middle of the city of Cap to look there for the victims of that atrocious Negro and offer a portrait upon which reader, you may be forced to shed many tears, exclamation point, exclamation point, exclamation point. After a description of how Louverture ordered Henri Christophe to burn down Cap Francais in 1802, this is what the reader is told. The flames had scorched the earth and the iron had destroyed thousands of colonists. The blacks were at the head of the government, if we could call a government that assemblage of savages, brutes, disappointed men who drunk on vengeance were thrilled to dictate the law. The law! Little did it matter to them that they were reigning over debris, over heaps of ashes. They reigned. The novel's characterization of the Haitian revolutionaries as quote-unquote an army of tigers given over to rage actually reached independent Haiti, where it fell into the hands of General Christophe, So he wrote to the Emperor Dessalines to describe its contents in a letter, noting that the book, which he called Une Petite Brochure, so definitely not giving it the elevation of a novel, had come to him via a merchant ship from the United States. Christophe sent it to Dessalines with a note that said, this might amuse you in your moments of rest. In this letter, we glimpse not just the philosophical, semantic war between Haiti and the French, whereby the latter's persisting in calling uh, the former Saint-Domingue, but that the physical warfare had not really ceased between the two countries. So this is what Christophe wrote. The contents of this brochure leave no doubt about the views of our enemies. They do not even accord us the title of men, judging that we are not worthy of the liberty that we enjoy, that we conquered using the strength of our arms, and that no power on earth can ever take from us. But let them come, and I will give them new proof. So Haiti has to constitute itself, its independent, viol- its independence in repeatedly violent terms, even after independence. The second snapshot is about the physical war. In February 1806, and diplomatic war, as it were, Christophe sent Dessalines several extracts from U.S. newspapers that he'd just received. One of them contained a message from the President of the United States to the U.S. Congress, It was related to complaints the French government had made about U.S. citizens who were engaged in commerce with Haiti. Napoleon had repeatedly tried to interfere with U.S. trade to Haiti. He urged the U.S. government to break these ties entirely. Impassioned debates were pronounced on the floor of the Senate, some of which were favorable to our cause, Christophe said, which was a little putting it mildly. Most were not. Just under two weeks later, however, Christophe reluctantly came to believe that the U.S. might actually pass the formal trade restrictions due to ongoing pressure from the French. He reported to Dessalines that, first of all, a French military division had recently disembarked in Santo Domingo on the eastern side of the island, which was still occupied by France under the French general um, Jean-Louis Ferrand. The Haitian government would therefore need to be ready for any attack coming from that quarter, particularly in light of what was taking place with respect to U.S.-French relations. I am of the same opinion as your majesty, Christophe wrote to Dessalines. The Congress of the United States, out of deference to France, could very well forbid commerce between its subjects and our country. Around the same time he penned this letter, Christophe got hold of a missive from the brother of a U.S. merchant living in Capaïtien. This brother was counseling his own brother to continue to remain on the island and engage in trade because he didn't really think the bill was going to pass. Christophe was skeptical, but he acknowledged that the U.S. was in a tricky position. In terms of politics and their interests, it would be good for them to drag this matter out, but we are all prepared. It is worth noting that Christophe was getting information by unsealing the letters of foreigners doing business on the island and particularly by unsealing letters from the United States. So all of this is being done outside of a realm in which he can readily acquire the information. He's got to do it in this sort of uh, subterfuge way. Christophe's fear that the French were planning another invasion actually came from one of the letters he unsealed in September 1805. On the 5th of that month, the general-in-chief told Dessalines that he was sending him a letter that had come from the American continent and was addressed to a woman on a plantation in Jérémy. Christophe admitted to having unsealed the letter, as well as several others that arrived on other ships. 
They will prove to you, Christophe said to Dessalines, that our enemies have not yet given up hope of invading our country. It was a spy unsealing another set of letters that Christophe learned that the trade restrictions he feared had in fact been passed in the United States. Surveillance for the purposes of gathering foreign intelligence would next lead to censorship for the purposes of presenting, preventing that intelligence from circulating. For the first time in his correspondence with the emperor, Christophe ordered information to be hidden from the Haitian people. I have received with your letter, Christophe wrote to Joseph Rouenet, who is one of the major printers on the island, a copy of the debates that took place in the United States Senate. I do not think it would really be appropriate to have this asserted, inserted into the Gazette, which was Haiti's official newspaper. Gather together all the newspapers that you have received from the United States that discuss this material, and upon my arrival in CAP, remit them to me, for these are insignificant developments that we don't need to print in our newspapers. While the restrictions did have some deleterious effects, they did not entirely prevent U.S. merchants from continuing to conduct business on the island. And Julia Gaffield has a great book about this, Haitian Connections in the Atlantic World. But even if the Haitian people were to be exempt from this information that's being kept for them, Christophe did feel it necessary to inform Desalines. The same day that he asked Rouenet to not print this news in the Haitian Gazette, Christophe sent a copy of one of the news, U.S. newspapers to the emperor. I make haste to inform your majesty that I just learned from a U.S. newspaper that I have the honor of sending to you under this cover that the bill to suspend commercial relations between the United States and our country has passed. Despite having downplayed the seriousness of the bill, Christophe observed that already several U.S. businesses had written to their correspondents in Haiti to ask for the return of their funds. Christophe once again learned about this through his surveillance tactics. He reported to Dessalines that he unsealed several, letter, several letters and was now going to send them to the emperor as evidence. The restrictions, again, did not end trade between Haiti and the United States completely, but they did lead to scarcity on the island. There had already been a flour shortage in Haiti for some time because of the preliminary trade restrictions, and now there was no flour at all. Luckily, a U.S. ship had just docked in Haiti from Baltimore, again, that sort of clandestine illegal trade. Christophe wrote to Haiti's Minister of Finance on that occasion to say that the ship's fortuitous arrival was going to be an immediate bomb for the subsistence of the sick and wounded. I assure you, Christophe wrote, there is no flour at all in our stores and the sick in our hospitals are barely hanging on and have been subjected to the greatest of deprivations. Yet in the letter that Christophe wrote to Dessalines informing him of the passing of the trade restrictions by the U.S., he testified to a more acute problem facing the country, the French. Not only were the French at least partly responsible for the increasingly cold and distant relationship between Haiti and the U.S., but Napoleon had not entirely given up his designs of regaining control of the island. The fact that the French were still in possession of Santo Domingo and therefore had military ships constantly in the vicinity of Haiti presented constant perils. Sometimes the British helped out because they were at war with France, but just as when the Treaty of Amiens was struck in 1802, Haitians knew that as soon as a treaty between France and England created peace, England was no longer going to prevent Haitian or French ships from entering Haitian waters. So in March 1806, French corsairs indeed captured three Haitian caboteurs or coasting ships and subsequently kept some of the men in their possession. The French eventually released eight of the men and two of the ships but not before having dismantled and destroyed them. Christophe was greatly distressed when he learned of this event. Consequently, he urged Dessalines to take every measure possible to stop such sabotage. Otherwise, I foresee that every kind of evil he might arise, might arise, he said, the war that we are in with the French being eternal to the death, our ships, since they are the weaker, should rather crash into the side of these corsairs and our people should prefer to drown themselves rather than to allow themselves to be captured. And I will just finish with, I don't want to finish on that terrible note, but um, one that is slightly uh, more ridiculous and perhaps even more sad. Um, of course, you all have read the New York Times ransom piece, but I just want to add something that was not in the Times reporting. The original amount the colonists proposed that Haiti should pay in 1804 for, as an indemnity was 700 million francs. That was their original amount that they wanted. Thank you.
Thank you, Dr. Doe. What becomes interesting in what we've heard from the panelists focuses on the topic that we have today, and that is Haiti and the West engineering the failure of democracy. What we see in contemporary accounts, the accounts that we have on a daily basis, accounts that reference U.S. and Canadian diplomacy, if we might think about it in that way, in relationship to Haiti and to the broader Caribbean, are historically rooted. What the panelists have have revealed to us are, I think, three things that we need to take into account. First, Professor Pierre's uh, opening, which um, some of my students would love, Professor Pierre, we're looking at uh, notions of Afrofuturism, and here you evoke um, Jemison and the notion of what Haiti might look like at some particular point in time. What we're forced to think about is what Haiti might look like if we were, in fact, to take into account Professor Doubt's notion of, well, what is our responsibility as citizens of the hemisphere in terms of what Haiti has been and should be in this current moment? Professor Byrd has indicated that there have been attempts hemispherically and in specific notions among the African-American population to in fact, embrace its responsibility as members of an African diaspora to other spaces in the hemisphere and more particularly Haiti. Those things give rise to our notion, again, coming back to Professor Dow's notion ideas of listening to the Haitian voice. How many opportunities have we had in our most recent inquiries into Haiti to hear the Haitian voice and to understand that that voice has a historical legacy that resonates to this day, a historical residency that, in fact, has resulted in numerous kinds of Haitian resistance to the kinds of incursions that have come both, again, to quote Professor Doubt, in a discursive as well as physical war. And so the long durée of Haitian struggle for independence, Haitian liberty, Haitian illustrations of what, in fact, a liberated space might look like for not just simply people of African descent, but for all people, is rooted in the discussions that we might begin this evening in terms of looking at the ways in which outsiders have attempted to engineer the failure of Haitian democracy for numerous reasons. So I'd like to leave it open to the panel and to our audience to raise some issues about these particular points as they've come to us this evening in light of the current, as can I put it, crisis in quotation marks in Haiti. Panelists, would you have any ideas, any thoughts on this? I do, but I also don't want to be the first one to jump in. And I also want to leave, I'm not sure how we're doing on time. I also want to leave space for audience too. We're, to we're, waiting, we're waiting for audience re- responses. So um, don't be like my students. Please be the first to jump in. Dr. Bird. Yeah, sure. Well, I'll, I'll just pick up on one. Uh, thread uh, that you said and, and be very brief uh, with what I'm going to say. Uh, and it's that, uh, again, you know, I, I keep uh, coming back to uh, Marlene's uh, uh, article in The New Yorker, uh, but it, it's it's so crystal clear and lays out that when we talk about the history, uh, you know, particularly uh, a period that I'm uh, particularly interested in of uh, late 19th, early 20th century Haiti, and particularly the Haiti of the U.S. occupation era and then the post-occupation era, 
what we're really talking about is the history of a neo-colonial Haiti. Uh, so discursively in this point about, uh, you know, the, the power of the, the discursive and how it mirrors um, the political and the economic uh, it's clear there because in all these you know discussions, particularly when they pop up in European U.S. media about you know what what, what is the crisis in Haiti? What's wrong with Haiti? What what is this? And this it, it it elides and obscures the fact that uh, almost everything that we're talking about uh, has to be understood within the context uh, that it should be understood within. That this is a uh, the, the state that we are talking about, and we are talking about the state, and we have to separate that from the aspirations and uh, the aims and the desires of the people themselves. But the state that we're talking about, neo-colonial Haiti. Um, so when you understand that and you put that as the paradigm and the framework, uh, well, then that leads directly back to that question about, well, what if, what if we were to be able to talk about something different? What if we were able to talk about the actual the history of uh, you know the, the nation of, of the people themselves right and, and what they want and what if uh, the state we're talking about was reflective of those interests uh, that would be different and that is something um, that that is to come um, you know that, that is something that uh, you know that, that can be when that de- that that um, neo-colonial uh, imposition and that neo-colonial history is abolished, right? But until then, I, there is that, that futuristic element to it. There is that element of, um, you know, what can be, um, or we speak it optimistically and um, speak it in existence, what will be. I would also say, um, along with that sort of recognizing the ills of the past and and not acting as if it was all inevitable um, the way that things turned out is the element of restorative justice, which I think um, is often a missing piece because uh, for some reason, which we can all, um, we all know what that reason is. Again, um, as you quoted Frederick Douglass, uh, the world has never forgiven Haiti for being black, but um, Haitians are not considered and framed as being worthy of restorative justice, despite all of the, I mean, we could go decade by decade, let us go year by year. And yet, and I really, I hate to use this example, but I'm struck by the Alex Jones, Sandy Hook verdict, that this is, of course, a horrible tragedy, but I'm struck by the amount because it's a fictive amount of, of, it's nearly a billion dollars or something crazy like that, like 900 something million dollars. I'm struck by the amount that can be sort of awarded, even though it's impossible to pay such amount, because the idea that the atrocity was so great that there's no amount of money is to what that says. There's no amount of money that could repair it. And yet when we have a situation um, like with like Haitian history, um, even if we just take the indemnity where we can deter the actual amount. And one of the things I've said uh, before is even if the amount was symbolic, the amount of restitution was symbolic, I'm once again struck by the fact that that is a bridge too far, even for France to consider, for the United States to consider, for the UN to consider, for cholera. It is a bridge too far to even say, yes, you are guilty of this crime against humanity and here is your restitution even though we can never we know you can never and will never pay it i'm struck by that the symbolism cannot even happen in the haitian case precisely because i think the case is so strong to be honest um and because you know france they actually can pay is the other piece of that so i'll just i'll just add um so when we're thinking about the, enge- the engineering of the failure of democracy in Haiti, it's a planned out process, right? So um, I like when, when, when I'm teaching and guiding my students around the relationship between slavery and racism, racism is an ideology that emerges to justify labor exploitation, right? So In addition to Haiti not being forgiven because of its blackness, Haiti is not forgiven because it refuses labor exploitation on a fundamental philosophical level. 
And this, and if we are not able to confront that in systematic ways, it gets, it not only becomes the symbol of what labor exploitation should look like in a world that's expanding de democratic freedoms in the 19th century, it becomes the template for contemporary labor exploitation. So this is why I wanted to bring in the conversation about Trotsky. So the liberation of laborers in Haiti had to have been reproduced globally in order for Haiti to function in the way that its founding generation intended. So it's not simply about Haiti, it's about labor exploitation everywhere. So when we look at Haiti, Haiti can become a symbol of how we can think about labor exploitation here and to bring it back to Haiti, the, Im the immigrants who are coming into the US, they are the face of not only labor exploitation, but of surplus value laborers who are being pushed out for reasons that my co-panelists have discussed, right? So I think when I'm thinking about um, the broader US, we weren't even able to get a minimum, a federal $15 minimum wage, right? So if we're not able to think about labor exploitation in progressive ways in our within our own borders, what really can we offer to Haiti other than the immigrants who are here and that we can help in our local communities? There are strategic partnerships that can be made between universities and immigrant rights coalitions that can help the laborers who are coming into the country. Um, because I think the because I think the level of awareness that my colleagues, particularly Mar Marlena, um, is presenting through her writing, it's raising awareness because I don't think people really connect what's happening in Haiti with what's happening with labor exploitation in the US. So that's one level of engagement. But a more concrete level, level of engagement is what can we as a college educated audience offer to people who are on the front lines receiving these Haitians who are coming into our country? Excellent, thank you, thank you. There are three questions in the queue and I wanna begin in this way in terms of addressing them. The first question um, for the panelists regards the, the question of the Haitian diaspora in North America and France. And that question revolves around what might the position be in reshaping the relationship between Haiti and the United States and Canada and France in a more positive light? Can that come about? And also what role might remittance income play in empowering ordinary Haitians in ways that are independent from the oppressive and dysfunctional nature, nature of what we see as constituting the dynamics of the Western Hemisphere right now. Is there a role for the Haitian diaspora in, in this particular process and how do you see that? I would say there, I mean, there, there is in a way, so um, when Aristide was president, he had this kind of, um, he called the diaspora the 10th department of Haiti, essentially, right? Because of the remittance, remittance payments. But I think this actually, in a way, kind of speaks to what Nathalie was talking about with the rejection of the um, top-down labor exploitation models that in theory, the Haitian revolution was designed to, uh, uh, the Haitian revolution of 1791, I mean, was designed to upset, right? And so, um, Jean Casimir calls this the counter plantation, right? So you're doing small scale farming, or you can think of Etienne Dupin's wonderful documentary about Madame Sarah, all of the people and institutions, but kind of with a little eye, um, that, that, um, al have allowed Haitians, as Casimir says, to exist and to survive in this world that really wants to create workers, that wants to have, you know, laborers with a capital L. Um, and part of what the remittance payments also do is that they disrupt um, kind of the flows of capital in that worker 
um, with a large, you know, with a capitalized worker environment by um, kind of removing uh, different, and it's, I mean, the flows of money come in different ways and they, they come differently now than they used to because we have all of these apps and things like that. So this is a different world. In some ways, I'm giving you a snapshot of like what it used to be like in the eighties or nineties when people used to literally mail money or they used to be using, you know, um, sort of like wire services for money, but, um, they were doing things that really the state, the Haitian state, couldn't necessarily kind of control or co-opt if they want to exploit their workers who are working in a factory, for example. And that's one of the reasons why the Madame Sarah, um, if you watch Etan Dupin's wonderful film, that this is not an accident that the market that these women are using and rely on is burned down to the ground multiple times. This is not an accident. It's about controlling the flow of money in Haiti. And so I think we, we absolutely have to think about what it means for Haiti and Haitians, again, to go back to Casimir, to try to exist outside of those big capitalist structures. There's still a market. It's not that there's not things being sold and traded and exchanged, but it doesn't, uh, the Madame Sarah are not, it's a reciprocal what they're doing. It's not in designed to enrich one person, an oligarch, at the expense of, you know, hundreds or even thousands of people as in a CEO in a, in a large company. So I do think that there is some piece there um, for the diaspora to think about what their role is moving forward and not just decrying the ills, not just welcoming Haitians here and creating, which is all of these things absolutely have to happen, but um you know, what What do we owe back to Haiti, which is what those remittance payments were ultimately about. Every time, you know, you go to Haiti, you bring money for your family and your friends, and you, and that's just the way that it works. But there has to be, I do think, something more, and I don't exactly know what it is, but. So, D Dr. Bird, uh, you've mentioned that U.S. involvement in Haiti did not fully end in 1934. So the, the follow up question to that is some sense of elaboration on the ways in which the United States remains involved in Haiti and the current crises that we see now. Uh, yeah, uh, so this is this is something that I'll, I'll ask my, my fellow panelists to help me because I'm sure I will miss some things because the list is long. Uh, so I am in. Just in the immediate occupation era, the 1534, I, some of the things that happened there, uh, I mean, the, the legacy is long. The, the modern Haitian army, uh, that's a product of uh, the U.S., how it organizes it in during the occupation. Uh, and then so then on a more abstract level, a more uh, militarized society, uh, I think we could say, is a is a product of uh, the occupation. Um uh, the U.S. maintains uh, control over uh, it's the Haitian finances for uh, another decade after the U.S. occupation. Um, they do so formally, formally. Uh, uh, the U.S., uh, uh, in part due to uh, the role that it played in dictating uh, Haitian politics and appointing uh, Haiti's leaders during the occupation, um, uh, sets a precedent and maintains the role for being, uh, uh, how to put it, basically the, uh, I, I don't know how to put it eloquently as, uh, it, it has continued to play that role moving forward and also in a way that, uh, uh, Haitian elites and Haitian politicians would continue to court, uh, U.S. favor as a way to legitimate, quote unquote, legitimate themselves or at least maintain power. Obviously they are less concerned with, uh, being legitimate players in the eyes of um, uh, of Haitians themselves. Uh, so to make that less abstract, I mean something like uh, uh, Shada in the uh, the 1950s, the uh, uh, Haitian American Society for Agricultural Development. This it's uh, English translation uh, that uh, part raises uh, the Haitian countryside to clear land for uh, uh, it's a U.S. centered uh, uh, agricultural development corporations, right? And that's, of course, land owned by, uh, 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 Haitian peasantry. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, Duvalier era, of course, famously, the U.S. lends support, uh, financially, uh, ample, uh, you know, financial support, um, uh, basically in the name of 
anti-communism. Uh, yeah, the, the, the U.S. will uh, will intervene. Uh, you know, you know, obviously uh, in in the '90s and the 2000s. Uh, uh, yeah, again, I. <laughs> I, I'm sure I'm, I'm leaving some things off, but uh, again, the, the list the list would be long. Um, so yeah, I guess that, that's in the long the the, the short answer uh, would be um, you know to the, to that question about how uh, how that role was maintained after occupation. It's uh, it's in for, from my perspective, it's it's in most uh, facets of uh, uh, of Haitian political. Um, economic life. Oh, and I guess to our point about this conversation about labor, uh, obviously a large part of the occupation, the business of that is extracting Haitian labor through the resuscitation of uh, old colonial uh, uh, labor codes. Uh, and that attempt and uh, sometimes successful attempt uh, to extract uh, labor make uh, uh, basically Haiti uh, conducive uh, to the interests of U.S. capital, uh, you know, that persists throughout the 20th and 21st century. Uh, that's one of the more uh, well-known examples is the production, uh, uh, not sure how long, uh, but certainly in the, uh, the 70s and 80s, the production of uh, most baseballs produced um, uh, in the major leagues uh, were in uh, factories, um, you know, um, for all and purposes, sweatshops, low-wage uh, labor factories in Haiti. You're on mute, Dr. Keita. Thank you. I, I do that quite often. Um, another question that, that gives us historical perspective is, is the relationship, um, given Douglas's attribution that Haiti is being, pub, being punished for being Black, what was the relationship that we might think about in terms of American and British abolitionists in holding up the Haitian Revolution as a model for what might come. I, I can I can hop in really quickly on that one. Um, the abolitionists did not take it up as a model because the fear of the insurrection itself terrified Atlantic world observers. So Haiti was not used as an example of what a post-slavery society could be. Some scholars have even argued that in the aftermath of the Haitian revolution, um, the abolitionist movement actually stalled because of the fears that black freedom um, cultivated in the hearts of plantation owners throughout the Atlantic. Um, but Dr. Keita, I, there's a question that I really want to hop on, which made me hop on this one. And I know that we're short on time, but I, I would really like to address it if my colleagues don't want to address that. Please do. Please um, so uh, to, uh, yes, to Gregory Damas, the second part of your question about the growing level of pessimism around the current state of the country and how far removed it is from the country they grew up in. So these successive waves of pessimism around uh, possibilities of Haiti, I, I think every generation of Haitian experiences this level of pessimism. So I know that for we millennials, many of us, we threw everything we had in post-earthquake reconstruction efforts. And then to see the assassination of an elect, well, a quasi elected leader, right? To see that happen on the world stage, it is very demoralizing, but I wanna offer up an aphorism that your grandparents' generation most certainly um, are familiar with. And it's um, nuled menula. And the literal translation is, we're ugly, but we're here. And it's one of these aphorisms that I really hated hearing growing up. Um, and I guess uh, the best US translation would be that Maya Angelou poem, um, I, I, I don't want to uh, survive, I want to thrive. So that was my counter narrative to such an aphorism. But this is one of 
the, the, the cultural aphorisms that have given successive generations of Haitians to endure the labor that is freedom. So freedom requires, um, unfortunately, a certain level of sweat capital and endurance that, um, that is part of what makes the Haitian Revolution so inspiring. Um, and the other thing that I can offer is the words of the leader of a contemporary uh, labor movement in Haiti, which is called Mouvement Paysan Papay, MPP. And the leader during COVID, he did one of these Zoom presentations. And he told us that the way that we move forward is that you teach the children to love the culture. You teach the history of the place. And that becomes the sweetness that helps them in the fight for freedom. Um, and the other thing is to teach evidence-based history, right? So there is this idea that yes, Haiti is the poorest nation in the Western hemisphere, but there are ways that Haiti functions in the global economy that are not visible because of the weight of that narrative. So for example, Haiti is the dominant um, importer of all of the herring in this Canadian town. So without Haitian consumers, there would be no labor in this Canadian town. But because of the way that the narratives around Haiti circulate, and this is an argument made by our colleague Gina Ulis, um, Haiti needs new narratives. There's a way that we can look at the consumption of herring that is produced in Canada. So these, so the poorest nation in the Western hemisphere is financing entire lives in one of the most industrialized spaces in the Western world. So those are the two strategies that I would offer. Um, pessimism is real, but these are, the, these are some of the strategies that we can use to inspire the study of Haitian history and to re-narrate what we do know about Haitian history. So let me summarize as we come to um the end of our time here and i'll go back to this this wonderful phrase you just gave us um dr pierre the labor that is freedom well part of the labor that is freedom is is in fact um recognizing the evidence that provides for new narratives around the question of haiti but what haiti means to all of us who think about struggling against oppression on a global scale and so Haiti becomes illustrative. It becomes one of those moments in history and in contemporary space that gives us a notion of what a future might be if we, in fact, take up the labor that is freedom. So I want to thank each and every one of you for joining us this evening. I want to thank the audience for being with us and for providing us with these questions that allow us to open up this notion of Haiti a bit more, and to also ask everyone to embrace the questions of looking at the intricacies and nuances that make Haiti and the Haitian people, and to go beyond the tropes and conventions that we've been fed about Haiti, the second oldest democracy in the Western Hemisphere. Thank you very much. Thank you to the audience for joining us. Everyone have a great evening. The recording has stopped. Thanks for the great moderation, Dr. Keita. That was great. You know, I'm I'm in the midst. So here's a, my my real trepidation. Okay, I'm in the midst of of three brilliant, not only brilliant, but the thing that frightens me most: young scholars. Okay. <laughs>
and I, I'm struggling to keep up. I'm, you know, keeping trying to keep pace with all of this stuff. OK, so, yes, this was wonderful. Uh, you know, what we need to do is invite the three of you to Villanova to help me run uh, the graduate seminar on the Atlantic world next semester. In fact, I just want to sit back and put my feet up and let you guys do the work, okay? <laughs> but yes, this, this was amazing. So uh, thank you very much for joining us. Oh, for sure. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, I just wanted to say before y'all got out of here, this was like truly incredible, remarkable. It's like definitely my favorite of the panels we've had this year. Um, so thank y'all very much for, uh, you know, spending the time.